led to uh, bless them financially to help assist in going on this trip, I'm sure they would not refuse that. So if that's you, find them after service. And now I want to take a minute to introduce our guest speaker. This morning is Jay Seidler. Uh, he was here maybe four or five years ago, um, but we've invited him back to share again. He works closely with someone that was here just a couple months ago, Kenji. So if you remember Kenji, he works closely with Kenji. He is a U.S. missionary for Kai Alpha, and he's going to probably tell you a little bit more about that. Of course, you've already heard some of it, but would you give him a warm welcome as he joins me on the stage, Jay Seidler. Thank you, Jay. Appreciate it. You want me to get oh, she's getting Thank you for having me again. It tells me the last time I was here that uh, you guys have been supporting us and faithful to us and that... Um, that you guys love what we do and you're behind us. Um, we, uh, let me show, can you throw up the picture of my family just as I'm opening my stuff and getting ready? This is my family. Uh, if you were walking in as we were here, you probably saw a little bit of chaos in the lobby as we're getting our kids gathered. Uh, my, my family takes up a lot of space physically. Uh, they just kind of spread themselves out um, but we have four children that we've adopted out of the foster care system. So you can see Jude up in the, the top uh, left corner for you. Hank is next to him. So Jude is nine, Hank is eight. And then there's Ari. I don't know why she's laughing hysterically at the picture, but she is. Um, Ari has cerebral palsy. She's in a wheelchair. But she is a joy, the, the joy and the, the jewel of our family. Um, she is five. And then you have Anna. Uh, being held by me, she is four, but she is um, the extrovert of all extroverts. I was mowing the lawn yesterday, and my kids were playing out front. She asked if she could ride her bike her with training wheels, you know, on our sidewalk, and so she is. Our neighbors have company. Our neighbors are not very social, but... Um, and I, I could probably count on one hand how many times I've seen our neighbors outside of their house. And in the last year that we've lived there, and they were out of the house, and Anna made a beeline for their car as they're getting out of the car. And she's like accosting them with greetings and hugs. And I th <laughs> just thought it was the funniest thing in the world. So I had to stop the mower and like help them by helping her back to my yard. Um, but uh, I'm sure she will probably be a missionary or a great pastor or somebody that brings people to Jesus. She does not know a stranger. Um, but yeah, this is our family. Uh, we have been serving in Chi Alpha for 10 years. Um, we uh, are now at Ohio State University. This is a picture of our group right now. Um, at, the, at our last midweek service that we had for the school year, um, our group grew quite a bit this year. We grew by at least 50% uh, by our missional, what we would call missional reach. So uh, that means that we have students that come to services, we have students that are involved in small groups, we have students that are being discipled, and we have students that are connected to all of those things that we are in the process of reaching and sharing the gospel with. And um, our missional reach uh, probably doubled this year, and then our, our inherits and those that are faithful and involved, they grew by, by 50%. But this is our group, an incredibly diverse group of students that is quickly growing our leader, our student leadership. So these are students that make disciples and lead small groups. Our leadership, student leadership doubled this year from 10 to 20, over, over doubled, so 10 to 21 next year. Um, and this is a group that was planted during COVID by Kenji and his wife and their team that came from Indiana. And we've been uh, blessed to join their team and what God has been doing there. I've been really pleased with, with uh, what they've been doing, what they've established, and love that we've been able to come alongside and join what they're doing and being faithful in. Um, my wife and I, like I said, we've been doing Chi Alpha for 10 years. Um, and our history is we were students with Chi Alpha um, at Wright State University, where Michelle was, and uh, she's an alumni of Chi Alpha at, at Wright State University, but we were there for four years as students, then we were in the marketplace for about 10 years, 
um, making disciples and sharing Jesus in the marketplace. I'm an engineer by trade. Ashley worked in the medical field with me um, at the same company, and we shared Jesus in our workplace all the time and discipled people that we knew and made friends and shared the gospel. That was one of our greatest passions. I loved, um, we served bivocationally. We were also part-time at, at local churches, serving in worship and young adults ministry in different roles. But one of our greatest loves in life was being bivo bivocational pastors. Um, I know that a lot of pastors love when they can like focus on one thing, and I, I truly enjoy focusing on one thing. But man, I love being bivocational. I loved serving the church, but also being in the world and among people who don't know Jesus in places that, that pastors can't go <laughs> um, and sharing Jesus. And so I'll have a story about that later. But that we did that for 10 years, and then the Lord pulled us out of the marketplace. Begrudgingly, we did not want to leave the marketplace because we loved sharing Jesus there so much. But the Lord asked us to pioneer Chi Alpha at University of Dayton, and so we did. Um, and we were there for 10 years. We pioneered there. We started with one student. Um, and I'm trying to think, I was here probably around 2019 or so. And uh, we had just... Um, we had just come up from underground. We were underground for the first four years or so. We were above ground for the last five years of that. Um, that's our time there. It was a rough plant. It was hard work. Um, at times, it felt like we should have belonged in the Middle East the way that we had to run things at the Catholic University there. But the Lord was faithful. We made disciples. We sent students into church planting. We sent students in world missions. We sent students into university ministry. We sent students into the marketplace that are making disciples, being faithful to Jesus, raising their families to know Jesus now. We're so grateful for what God did at the University of Dayton. But uh, about 2022, the Lord had begun to speak to us about transition, and uh, we just obe were obedient to obey the next thing the Lord said and the next thing the Lord said, and uh, we had some sovereign and divine conversations that just that happened. It wasn't coincidental, and so through that, we, f we saw the writing on the wall, so to speak, and felt the Lord was asking us to go to Ohio State. The only thing was that um, they didn't ask us to come. And so, uh, so uh, I was sitting with Kenji at an Ohio Chi Alpha retreat with our students there. We brought students from University of Dayton and his students are there from Ohio State. And we're sitting at like 2 in the morning. He's working on a breakout session for the next day. I'm redoing some of the media because the, the, the speaker changed all their slides. And so I had to stay up and do that. So it's about 2 in the morning. We're sitting in this lounge and we're trying to work on our stuff for the next day. And we're just chatting, asking me how things are going. And I said, yeah, this is what the Lord's been saying. Just trying to be transparent to a friend and figure out what the Lord's doing. Just, you know, I don't want to put on like I don't, like I'd have everything together. I know what's going on. So I'm just like, I'm a wreck. I don't know what the Lord's doing. I want to be here, but I feel the Lord pulling me away. And this is what we feel. And he's like, well, if you came to Ohio State, we'd take you. And I thought, ah, oh, Lord, what are you doing? So the Lord spoke to us, and, and that just started the, the path for us to go to Ohio State. We bought a house in Columbus, praise the Lord. And uh, the Lord has been taking care of us. Um, we have been trusting the Lord to take care of our family and transition. Um, I am a small town kid. I grew up in a town of about 2,000, and I have never wanted to live in a city, but I keep moving to bigger and bigger cities, and I am out of my comfort zone. And so... Um, but that is our that is our history. We uh, one of the greatest passions of our family is fulfilling the Great Commission. Um, I mentioned I was in the marketplace, and I mentioned I was have been in vocational full time ministry. I've been in the local church. I've been in campuses, and my greatest passion and our greatest passion as a family through all of that has been the fulfillment of the Great Commission. Um, we love supporting missionaries. We have a missionary board that our kids see in the hallway of our house, and we love supporting missionaries. We love building relationships with them and having them stay at our house when they're coming through. Um, we love sending teams from our campuses to spend time with them and see what they're doing firsthand. We love praying for missionaries. We also love discipling students, finding them and feeding them and, and fighting for them and raising them up and sending them out to become them, to become missionaries as well. Um, and as the Assemblies of God, we were founded as a missions movement. If you would, uh, 
could you pop up the Matthew 28 scripture here? It says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. This is what we would call the Great Commission. You know, uh, over 100 years ago, 1914, Hot Springs, Arkansas, the Assemblies of God was founded by 300 people that came together and said, hey, I think we're better together than we are apart, and we want to commit to the greatest evangelization the world has ever seen. And to this day, we have over 5,000 missionaries in every country and territory in the world. We have missionaries that serve inner cities and campuses and other places all over the United States. Um, and it, and, and this, the, the, the Great Commission is a big deal, and we have committed to make it a big deal in our movement. This is why we have missions giving goals. This is why we have missions emphasis weeks. This is why we talk about missions and we have missionaries and we pray for missionaries and we send people to go do the work across the world. Thank you, um, uh, Leah and, I'm sorry, what's, uh, Kara, right? Thank you, Leah and Kara, for going and not just giving or praying, but going and seeing what God is doing across the world. You guys are examples to us, so thank you for your sacrifice. Um, but it is a big deal. The Great Commission is a big deal. The implication is that is it just we have a lot. It just means that we have a lot to do in a lot of places, and there's a lot of people and a lot of money that it takes to fulfill what Jesus wants us to do as a movement, as a body, uh, as His body on the earth. Um, It's, it deserves a lot of attention, but we cannot neglect nor ignore the fact that there are unreached people with the gospel still among us. Sure, Bibles need translated, there's compassion ministries, there's churches that need planted across the world, and there are still unreached people groups, there are thousands of languages that still have no gospel. There are, there are thousands upon thousands of towns that have no church or no gospel witness, people groups that have never been introduced to Jesus at all. I just spent a two-week vision trip in Southeast Asia, and there, there is a, a population of people in Southeast Asia that have no clue who Jesus is. They've never heard the name. It's wild to think about that there are places on earth that Jesus is not even mentioned and has never been mentioned since he was here on earth. But there still are. And yes, we want to commit to that. But how do we take such a massive obligation from the Savior of the world, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, and how do we make it make sense in our own life for right here, right now? What does the Great Commission actually mean for Marion, Ohio? What does it mean for Centerpoint Church? It's a, it seems like a really simple question, right? It's like, well, just... Tell you the gospel where it's not. But it's complicated when you actually apply it to life. It feels really simple, like, oh, just tell people about Jesus. But it's not that simple in your life. Your life is not as simple as you would like it to be, to make it easy to share the gospel. My hope is not today is not to answer that question as much as it is to get us in front of Jesus, to have Jesus start to speak to our heart about what that answer is. I'm not the expert on your, on your life Pastor Joe and Pastor Emily are not the experts on your life. All we can do is bring you to the feet of Jesus with us and hope that he speaks to our hearts and he changes us. I'm hoping today that, that, that our, our, our view of what is around us changes. So before we be, uh, go any further, I'd like to pray. Can we do that? Jesus, we, um, we don't want to pray and commit to this just as a formality, but we truly ask that you would speak to our heart Lord, you would take your anointed words and your anointed mission and your anointed presence, Lord, and you would, you would saturate our hearts in it. Lord, that our hearts would be moved and, and positioned in such a way that it, that it changes our future from here. And just like Kara said, I did this one thing and my life was ruined and I was changed forever from that moment. So let us pray that even today would be a moment when we look back and we say, the Lord started to do something on that day in my heart. And Marion's not the same. My house is not the same. My city is not the same because of what you started today. In Jesus' name, amen. Do you guys like optical illusions?
Anyone? Like uh, pictures that you have to look at and study and try to figure out? Or like, do you guys remember the um, 3D stereograms? You guys know what I'm talking about? Well, like they had like this looked like uh, old TV fuzz, you know, like when you used to have the rabbit ears and you have fuzz in your TV, but you kind of cross your eyes and tilt in a certain light and you kind of see this picture pop out. I used to love those things. My dad was really obsessed with that. My dad is a, a photographer uh, by hobby, not by trade, but he loved photography and and uh, loved optical illusions and neat photographs and things. And so I have a couple here that I want to show you. Here's one. Believe it or not, there is a copperhead in this picture. I'm going to give you about 10 seconds. See if you can find the copperhead. Anyone see it? Raise your hand when you see it. Oh, we got one, we got two, three, four. Okay. All right. You reveal it. And it's right there in the middle. Isn't that amazing? All right. Isn't that weird? You could be walking in the forest and not see it, step on it, and die from it, and not even know what you died from. <laughs> How many here didn't even know what a copperhead looked like? Anyone? All right. Yeah. See, it's, it's hard to look for something you don't know what it is. All right. I got one more here. This is find the snow leopard. You can see the snow leopard somewhere in the picture. Raise your hand when you see it. Okay, somebody, two, three. It's really hard. All right, reveal it, reveal it. And there he is right there behind that rock. All right, how many thought, how many was looking where the snow was, looking for a white leopard? Anyone? Uh, the first time I saw it, I was looking for a white, a white cat, and it's not white, it's actually brown. But you know, optical illusion, the thing about optical illusion is once you see it, you'll never unsee it. You'll, it's a, it seems like it, play, it plays tricks on your brain, but then like suddenly, the next time you see this picture and someone's like, you see it on social media, like, oh, here's a snow leopard in this picture, you know exactly where to look. Oh, it's behind the rock, you know, top left corner. You're going to see it. And the next time you see that picture of the copperhead, you're going to see it. Sometimes, you know, things, things are hard to spot because you've never looked at it that way. You don't even know what it looks like to begin with. And what I'm hoping to do today is I'm hoping that the Lord will change the way you have, you have seen Matthew 28, 19, and 20 forever. I'm hoping that the way you see your life and you see the, your, your obedience to him will change in a way that will cause you to never be able to look at it the same ever again. My life has been ruined to see people come to Jesus that don't know Jesus. In the same way that someone did for me, because they saw Jesus not in my life, and they said, Jesus needs to be there. And they brought Jesus into my life, and my life has been changed. And so, because my life has been ruined, I now want to ruin your life with me. Can we do that together? All right? So, um, Matthew, so back to Matthew 28. All right, so can you show up the scripture again, Matthew 28? So it says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay, so... Um, the operative verb in this scripture is not actually go. I know we love to like use the word go, you know, we have it as like this rally cry for our missions things, but it's actually in the Great Commission, the operative verb is not go, it's, it's make, it's make disciples. And Jesus, Jesus gave this command not so they would go, they've been going since they met Jesus. The Son of Man has no place to lay his head. The foxes have their dens, the birds have their nests, and the Son of Man has no place to live. You know, he's been, he's been a nomad preaching and walking with his 12 disciples and whoever followed him for three and a half years. And simultaneously, the, the 12 know that, and Jesus knew that when he said, go and make disciples. He knew that they were already going to be going. And there's other reasons why I, um, I'll, I'll reveal in a little bit, why I think he already knew that they were not going to be in Jerusalem for very long. But it's make disciples. So what do I mean by make disciples? Really, it's, it's a very simple definition. My definition of what it means to make disciples is leading others to Jesus where you have already been with him. That's it. You just got to be a step ahead of someone else, of where they are in Jesus. And my goal, I don't know, you know, this is my personal thing, but my goal is that, is that whenever I'm with someone and I want to introduce them to Jesus, it's not that I want to get them saved or I want to get them plugged into the local church necessarily. Sure, that's the eventual goal. But I would just want to bring them one step closer to Jesus because they encountered me. And that might include that I've never met a Christian who actually loves Jesus and, and obeys what he does. And so after you've met me, I've hoped that I've changed your mind. 
Or I've met Jesus and a different kind of Jesus, but I'm hoping to introduce you to the Jesus that I actually know, that is actually real, that is forever on the throne and loves you and has died for you, not the one who is trying to get you to do something for him or submit to him or whatever it is. But I want to introduce you to Jesus in a way that you've never been introduced to him. One step closer to Jesus. You know, it's not simply enough that we live a godly life without explanation in front of people who don't know Jesus. It's just not enough. There's a quote by uh, Francis of Assisi. It's a really famous quote. You could probably finish this. It says, preach the gospel. Uh, let's say it's preach the gospel at all times and when necessary. What is it? You guys know the last phrase? Use words. Preach the gospel at all times when necessary and use words. Now, if you know anything about Francis of Assisi, you know that he actually used words a lot. He preached everywhere all the time, even to like animals in the forest, supposedly. He was just obsessed with making sure that everything in all of creation knew the gospel of Jesus. And I think if Francis was here today, now that quote is often, I think it's wrongly attributed, but I think if he heard it and he was here today, he would say, preach the gospel at all times and when necessary, use words, which is all times. It's always necessary to use words. It's always necessary. The Great Commission is a command that goes beyond that of professional, vocational Christians. It goes beyond vocational missionaries. It goes beyond vocational pastors. It goes beyond the life of those that are super Christians and those that, well, that's, I mean, that's for Kara. Like, Kara, that's Kara's job. Like, she's obsessed, and that's just, some, that's just exactly what she would do. No, 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 it's, it's for everybody. It's for everyone who follows Jesus. The Great Commission is for everyone who follows Jesus. It's part of the normal life of every follower to bring the gospel to where it is not for all time among all people until he returns. It is, as you live your life, as you go, it is safe to assume Jesus has sent you. That's what the Great Commission is saying. It is safe to assume that Jesus has sent you there. Now, wherever you find yourself, wherever Jesus has led you, that means every relationship, every place you live, every place you go, every place you work. He has sent you to your nephew's birthday party to bring Jesus among your family. He has sent you to, that, to, the, to the co-worker's cubicle because you couldn't find that one document. He sent you there. He's, he sent you to your kid's school for their kindergarten graduation. He sent you to that track practice that you don't want to sit out and you're cold and miserable and you're sitting next to other parents. He sent you there. He sent you to that neighborhood when you found that random house on Zillow and it was the only house that fit your needs and your budget and you just happened to move there. He sent you to that neighborhood. He sent you to Marion, Ohio when you thought you were going to move somewhere else or go somewhere else or work somewhere else and you're still here. He has sent you to Marion, Ohio. Calling is a not a matter of if, it is a matter of where. You are called simply because you follow Jesus. Now it's his job to get you to where you need to go. It's his job. In Acts 1, 4 through 9, it says this. It says, starting in verse 4 here, Acts 1. You got it? There it is. On one occasion while he was still eating with them. Now Jesus is just raised from the dead. He's getting ready to send to heaven. He's given the one last command. While he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Don't leave Jerusalem, but wait for my gift, the Father's promise, which you have heard, from me, heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And then he gathered... Uh, then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, it's not for you to know the times the dates my father is set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. And after he said this, he was taken up before their eyes, and the cloud was hid from them, hid them from their sight. And they all went, no, 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 I have questions. Don't go yet. I have so many things to ask you. What do you mean? What do you mean? You know, like... If I, I am a person of questions, I always have a lot of questions. I'm the guy at the end of every presentation or meeting when they're like, does anyone have questions? I have questions. All right? My questions would be like, how, how am I going to do this without you? I've only done this with you. Or 
what about all the times I failed? What about that time I tried to cast out the demon and the guy stripped my clothes off and beat me up? Like, what if that happens again? How do I know where to go? How do I know when I'm going to go there? What if I'm not good at it? Like, how am I going to get good at it if the best one who showed me how to do it is now gone? You ascended. What are you doing? I don't know what to do. Um, is this something I have to, like, I have to feel called to, or is this something I just, like, I got to do? How am I going to know if I'm ready? Like, I have real questions. As I'm being sent by Jesus, I have real questions, and those are not questions that, like, I, I made up for the sermon. Those are questions I actually have for myself. I know it's weird. I, like, I'm a, I'm a professional missionary. I've been doing this for 10 years. I still have questions about my call and mission in Jesus. One thing you have to remember with the, in this context is here, Jesus has been preparing them for years. I'm sure some were like ready and chomping at the bit, but I'm sure others were just not sure what to do next. Or they weren't, we weren't, maybe not even sure what to do in general, but here's what I think. I think it's not so much that you know what to do, it's just that you're ready to be obedient in the next thing. It's not always competency. It's it's open hands, and it's a posture of obedience. I may look like a fool. I may not know what to do. I may not know who I'm going to go to or where I'm going to go. I'm just, here you go, Lord. I'm open. We have to do this in order to live as sent people. I was, uh, you know, I was on campus one day at University of Dayton, and I had to get some work done before I was going to meet some students for discipleship. I, there was nowhere to sit because it's busy, it's lunchtime, and I just happened to sit at this really long table. It's kind of awkward, but I was like, I got to get some, some work done, send some emails and stuff. So I open my laptop, I'm working. As soon as I sit down, there's a girl and this other guy that sit because there's nowhere else to sit. And they sit, there's a whole, it's a long table of like 20 chairs. And they sat right in front of me. It's real awkward. I'm just like working. And then she looks at me, she says, hey, what's your major? And I thought, oh, I got stuff to do. I was like, I had like, I have like 30 minutes and I got to do this. And I shut my laptop and I engaged her in conversation. Like, oh, I'm not a student. I work with a student organization here, you know. And she's like, oh, what organization? So I explained that. And, you know, and she's like, oh, yeah, I'm not really a Christian. I'm Buddhist. And I thought, oh, man, I just want a normal conversation. I'm not, you know, <laughs> I'm being real. I'm being real, okay. I'm hoping you see yourself in this. And so it just so happens, it just so happens that I had just taught a class on world religions. And I knew a lot about Buddhism at the time. It was fresh on my mind. And I said, I said, oh, what is, what is Buddhism? And she explains, and I said, that's not Buddhism. That's what you want Buddhism to be, but that's not Buddhism. Here's what Buddhism is. Do you really believe that? And she's like, oh, yeah, I don't believe that. And I said, okay, all right. I was like, well, what do you believe? And she's like, my religion is love. I said, if your religion is love, you probably have the best definition of love in the whole world. What is, the, what is your definition of love? And she said something, you know, real lovey-dovey and, you know, just really feeling and just surfacey. And I was like, that's not love. And she's like, that's not love? And she's like, well, then fine, what's love? And so I just contextualized, without saying it, but I contextualized Romans 5, 5 through 8. God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. And there's a whole talk about like, the agape love of Jesus. And I just uh, contextualize it. Didn't say it was scripture. Didn't mention Jesus. As mentioned, she said, she, her eyes popped open like, that is the best definition of love I have ever heard. And our conversation opened about Jesus. And so I said, hey, I'm, having a, I'm leading a Bible study tonight with some students in a dorm. Here's the dorm. Here's the number. You should come. And she said, okay. So she shows up. She's in our thing, and she has hardly any church background at all, and we're, at the end, uh, we're taking requests for prayer, and she's like, well, I have a friend, she's really sick, she's, you know, she's in the hospital right now, and I said, well, we believe that if we pray for, we can pray for her, but we're going to lay hands on you in her stead. Can we do that? And she said, yeah, sure, whatever. So we lay hands on her, 
And as we're praying, she begins to weep and shake in the dorm room. And she opens her eyes when we're done. She says, what did you do to me? And I said, I didn't do anything to you. I, I said, what did you feel? And she's like, she starts to describe like this feeling of love and the weight of, of G, you know, what was the weight of the presence of God. And I said, I think God is doing something in your heart and chasing you down. But see, none of that, none of those things would have happened. She would not have encountered Jesus in that dorm room had I not put aside myself and been ready for the next thing. It didn't matter that I happened to know what Buddhism was at the time. That's just how the Lord prepares us, right? The Lord prepares us in advance for good works he has for us. It just so happens that he's going to prepare you in the same way for whatever he's going to do in your life. In Acts chapter 8, here's another example here of how Jesus, here's what I think how Jesus knew. And this is, so this is when Stephen has, the, the, Stephen has just been stoned. And, you know, the, this is a big deal. This is the first time a Christian has ever been killed. They've been persecuted, and they've been kind of pushed to the side by the Jewish leaders and the Romans and things. But this is the first time a, a, that someone has been killed. And it says, on that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered through where? Judea and Samaria. This is so interesting. The 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 12 did not know that Jesus' declaration to them in Acts 1 was actually a prophetic word. You're going to be my, my, my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. And they're like, how am I going to get to Judea and Samaria? And this is it. Jesus knew they were going to go. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him, but Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women, put them in prison, and those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Now, this is such an interesting response to persecution. This is so interesting. Because had they responded any other way, Luke who wrote Acts, would have wrote it differently. Their attitude would have been something like, yeah, everything was going great in Jerusalem until Stephen had to open his mouth and make everyone mad, and now they're killing us, and we have to leave our homes, and we don't like it. But that's not what Luke wrote. Luke wrote, they were scattered through Judea and Samaria, insert persecution, burying their dead and being run off and carried to prison. But they were scattered and preached the word where they went. They took the gospel with them wherever they went. As you go, make disciples of all nations. It was because they knew the sovereignty of God that he would get them where they need to go with the message they had. This also, because they scattered and they went abroad, it set up the, the beginning of the Christian missionary movement. This was laying the groundwork for the guy in verse 3, that they faithfully went and took the gospel with them. And here we are building the on-ramp for the gospel to go to all the Mediterranean world through the very guy who killed their friend. But it's because of their obedience to be open-handed with the next thing. As you go, assume, G assume Jesus has something for you to do. As you go, it is safe to assume that Jesus has something for you to do. I graduated college in 2008 from Wright State as an engineer, and it was right at the beginning of the Great Recession. And I was promised that my department had a 98% employment rate for their students, but it turned out that when I graduated, it was the 98% unemployment rate for the students because there were no jobs. There were no jobs, and uh, I was, I went to as a humbling thing, I went to an employment agency with an engineering degree and said, I need a job. And they're like, you're overqualified for everything we have. I said, just give me anything. I need to put food on the table for my family. So I'm working this, these terrible jobs, you know, 
these things I don't want to do. And Ashley is working part-time at Claire's at the time, and they're doing this inventory where they, and all the girls who work at Claire's bring their husbands to go do the inventory. So here I am sitting at Claire's at 10 o'clock at night, sorting through earrings with an engineering degree. <laughs> One of the things that I've always dreamed of doing my whole life. And as we're sitting there and we're working, I'm talking to this other husband who got dragged here too. I'm like, what do you do? And he's like, oh, I work at this, you know, this medical devices company. And um, but I was like, oh, I have a degree in biomedical engineering. He's like, gosh, why don't you work there? And I was like, I've applied there seven times and they won't give me a job because they don't have any jobs open. And uh, he's like, I could get you a job. And so he gets me a job at this place. But it's not the job that I want. It's like the job that I got. And so I'm working more or less manufacturing and medical devices, and I, I'm an engineer. But it's like, it's fine. I'm just going to be faithful with what I have. I get stuck in this room with this 45-year-old woman who, doesn't, who, who cusses like a sailor, who does not know Jesus, has never been to church in her life. And, just, and, I'm, and it's, an, it's like a 10 by 10 room, and I'm stuck there for eight hours a day with her and two others. And it is the wildest environment that I've encountered in my professional life. And I've worked, remember, I worked a lot of jobs I didn't want to work, but this is wild. And... And I remember thinking I couldn't make the choices to put my head down and just work and get through it until I can get promoted and get the job that I want. But I think this is maybe where the Lord has me. And so I begin to share life and build relationship and love this woman and talk to her about Jesus and share about my own life and passions. Now remember, I'm an engineer. I'm not a pastor, okay? This is not my job to like make sure people know about Jesus in the workplace. This is what I want to do. And so I begin to share Jesus with grace, who does not know grace. She doesn't know Jesus. And, you know, there's things that, like, I invite her into my home, and I invite her into my life. And there's, a, you know, one time there was an ice storm, and I lived about two miles from the, our workplace. She lived, like, 30 minutes away, and there's an ice storm, and she's, like, trying to chisel her car out to the parking lot. I said, just get in my car, come to my house. So she came to my house, and she lived at my house for three days. We made her do meals, and we sat, and we chatted about the Lord and, and Jesus and life and just normal things. And she's introduced, she's seen what it's like to have Jesus in a household and a marriage for the first time ever. I mean, she's living in my house for three days, this 48-year-old woman. I'm 21, 22. It's weird, you know? It's uncomfortable, but I'm sharing Jesus with her. She never forgot it. Like, we've laid out the red carpet for her. We fixed meals that we have never fixed in our life, okay? The way we ate those three days is not how we eat. But I thought, we are going to show her the hospitality of Jesus in our house, and we did. Fast forward, in a, about a month later, we had a special, like, evangelist coming to our church, and she brought her two kids who were my age to church, and they had never been to church in their life and you bet your bottom dollar she was open to, me, open to me every time I shared the gospel with her after that. She doesn't serve Jesus today, but she met somebody who knows Jesus for the first time in her life. But it was because I walked into a place and decided I'm not just going to get through it and try to figure it out. I'm going to share Jesus. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring the message of Jesus where I'm planted. I'm being persecuted and scattered to, to the Judea and Samaria that I didn't want to go. I wanted to stay in Jerusalem. But I'm going to bring Jesus with me. Jesus has something for you to do everywhere he sends you. Your kids move from middle school to high school. Believe it or not, it was God ordained that your children were born, born in that year to encounter those parents in that grade. I know it's weird, but the sovereignty of God is so beyond our thinking that he, believe it or not, actually does order your steps. You got the job that you wanted. You got the job that you have, not that you wanted. Jesus gave it to you. You got the house that you had to buy because it was just the one it was. You couldn't afford anything else. Believe it or not, Jesus has you in that neighborhood. You got the in-laws you didn't want. <laughs> All right? Listen. Jesus gave you those in-laws. 
I didn't say it was my in-laws. I said it was your in-laws, okay? <laughs> Jesus has ordained your steps to take the gospel to places that you never meant to go. I want to land here. Acts 28. I want to set this up. You might find something undesirable and inconvenient in your life. But here is a prime example of inconvenience, okay? Paul has just been arrested. Imagine that. That's really inconvenient. He has plans for his life to go to Spain and go to other places. I mean, he writes about places he desired to go and take the gospel, and he never made it because he got arrested. He gets on a ship because he appeals to Rome. So the rule is, well, he's a Roman citizen. We've got to take him to Caesar in Rome. He gets on the ship. The ship, and he warns them, hey, don't go. This is not going to be a good journey. They go anyway. They end up in a storm. You know how long they were in a storm? Two weeks, y'all. A storm on the ocean for two weeks. That is a wild storm. I have been in some storms. All right, tornadoes have just come through Ohio several times. <laughs> and so far this spring, we have been in some storms that none of them had lasted two weeks on the open water. That is a wild encounter. Terrorizing. That is inconvenient. It's evident they're not going to make through it. Paul prays, receives a word, hey, we're all going to be okay. The ship runs aground on an island that they don't even know the name of it. And it's called Malta. Once safely on shore, we found out that the island was called Malta. There was an estate nearby that belonged to Publius, the chief official of the island, and he welcomed us into his home, showed us generous hospitality for three days. His father was sick and in bed, suffering from fever and dysentery, and Paul went in to see him, and after prayer, placed hands on him and healed him. Keep going. Verse 9. There we go. When this had happened, the rest of the sick on the island came and were cured. They honored us with, in many ways, and when we were ready to sail, they furnished us with the supplies we needed. After three months, we put out to sea in a ship that had been wintered on the island. Now listen, there is so much going on in this account, I don't even have time to get into it. It is a wild story. I cut out verses so we wouldn't be distracted. Actually, so I wouldn't be distracted, and I have spare you so you can go to lunch. But there is so much going on in this verse. I, wish you, I want you to read this account if you haven't read it or you haven't read it in a while. Here's something. This seems like it's really insignificant. Like it's just like, a, like kind of a, a side quest, you know, just how it kind of happens in this story of Paul just trying to get to Rome. And the whole point, and Luke makes the whole point of this to try to feel like, oh, yeah, like Paul's going to Rome. This is kind of just something that happened along the way. But this is actually really significant. It seems insignificant. But what we know from church history is that Publius actually came to know Jesus. Isn't that interesting? Publius, the chief official of the island, came to know Jesus, became the first bishop and overseer of churches in Christianity on the island. The whole island was converted to Christianity and became the first Christian province in a pagan Roman empire. Because Paul was inconvenienced and shipwrecked in a two-week storm on this island and almost died. That is crazy! Paul did not want to go to Malta. That island was so small and insignificant, it would have been passed over for, I'm serious, centuries. It was not in a strategic location. It was not a place that they were going to send missionaries to or the gospel was going to reach for a long time. But the Lord said, Paul is going to Rome. I'm going to shipwreck him on Malta, and I'm going to make sure that nation knows me. Paul could have had a sour attitude. I'm cold. I just got bitten by a snake trying to make a fire to warm myself and cook food. That's what happened. That's the part I cut out. I almost died twice. I am not sharing the gospel. These guys are pagans. What could happen? I'm just going to buy my time and get to Rome where I wanted to go. But Paul decides, no. 
The Lord is sovereign. He took me here. And he shares the gospel with, to the open door that was given to him with no intention of saving the whole island, but it was because of his faithful witness of Jesus in the place of his inconvenience that the whole island came to know Jesus and Publius was eventually martyred for his faith under Hadrian, the emperor. That is a wild side quest. That is a wild story. And we brush over Acts 28 all the time because Paul's getting to Rome. In our life, you just want to get to your Rome and we brush past so many opportunities the Lord is giving us. So many open doors to share the gospel or to be the neighbor that Jesus wants us to be just because I got to get my groceries in the house. I just need to get through the soccer game and I'm cold. Well, I touched someone's button there, sorry. <laughs> it's true. We do this all the time. I just want to check out. I don't want a conversation with this cashier. I, I got to get to my car. I'm, trying to, I'm late already. I'm trying to get this church potluck. I got to buy this dish on the way. I'm gonna do, I do this. <laughs> I don't want to engage with the cashier, but maybe Jesus took me to this cashier because this line was shorter. And the Lord's like, I'm going to make that line shorter because Jesus needs to be on that cashier's aisle. I cannot map out where Jesus is taking me. All I can do is be obedient where I am. I want you to know that as you go, it is safe to assume that Jesus is with you. I have no idea where the Lord would take you. I have no idea how he's going to get you there. But he will be with you as you go. We love the quote to Great Commission, but I want you to see the context surrounding this verse that we often just forget. We love, the, we love 18 and we love verse 19 and 20a, but I want you to see 16 through 20. Can we do that? Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. These are not confident people who know what they're going to do. These are people who don't know what they're going to do, and they're still doubting the divinity of Jesus. They're still doubting his commission. And it's on their doubt in which he lays this command. I feel like if it was me, I'd have been like, I don't know if you guys are ready for this. When I send the Holy Spirit, I'll give you this command when you're ready. But he sees their doubt and gives them the command anyway. Then Jesus came to them saying, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. It has not been given to them, and that's okay. You don't need to have all the authority in heaven and earth because I, the, son of, the risen Son of God, has all authority. And it's on that authority in which I'm going to make this command to you and I'm going to also impart my authority to you. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. There are nations they could not pronounce their name that he was going to send them to. They are uneducated fishermen. You're going to send me to the nations? I didn't think I was going to leave my hometown teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus was talking to a bunch of people who had no idea what they were going to do and how they were going to do it. They didn't know where they were going to find themselves and when they were going to find themselves there. But Jesus laid aside all of that and said, don't worry, I have all authority and I will be with you. I will send you a helper. I will send you the Holy Spirit. I want you to see yourself in the Great Commission. Tomorrow morning and whatever you do, this week, on Thursday night, wherever you find yourself, I want you to find yourself in the Great Commission and assume that Jesus has sent you there. Assume that he has something for you to do. Assume that he is with you as you do it. I 
I want you to have the joy of seeing the Great Commission finished in Marion, Ohio. The Great Commission can be finished in Marion, Ohio by you. This is not missions, it's not purely about praying, it is not purely about giving, though it is, that is part of it. But it is about going. And as you go, take the gospel with you, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Said by the man in verse 3, who killed Stephen. Would you stand with me? Thank you for being gracious with me today. Would you close your eyes and put your hands in an open posture? I want us to allow, as we pray, I want us to allow the Lord to bring names and faces to us that he has for us. Names and faces that we may overlook. Maybe those that we have been consistently reaching. Some of the things I've been saying, some of you live out all the time. This is not a new thing, okay? This is something that many of you in this room do all the time. You do it on accident because Jesus is in you and he has changed your life and you are ruined forever because you want Jesus to do in others what he has done in you. Thank you for being obedient to Jesus for years and years and decades in this community. Thank you, thank you, thank you. But our job is not done yet. While there is breath, there is still work. While this church is alive, there is still work to do. So Lord, it is with that that we say we commit to your great commission again. And for some of us, maybe the first time that we've ever made an actual commitment to say, Lord, finish the great commission through me. Spirit, Holy Spirit, bring names and faces to our mind. Bring relationships that we need to leverage for the gospel of Jesus to us right now. Move our hearts for those in our cities and in our lives and in our communities and the schools that we visit with our kids and the neighborhoods we live and the grocery stores we go to and the community organizations that we're involved with. We want to be the feed of Jesus as we go. We want to make the most of every opportunity. Jesus, we recommit ourselves to your great commission to make disciples as we go. Spirit, lead us to where you need us to be. Help us to not be in a hurry to rush through our life, but Lord, to take them, take the moment step by step and be obedient for the next thing. Lord, we want our conversations to be saturated with Jesus, that every conversation we encounter would lead to your truth and your gospel and your good news to a society and a world that has only bad news. We want to be a good news people in a bad news world. Empower us, Lord, as we doubt, as we doubt ourselves, as we doubt your mission, as we doubt things that we know should be guaranteed, but Lord, we commit ourselves to trust you who has all authority in heaven and earth and that it will be you who has sent us. It will be you who has prepared us in advance for things you have want us to do and that you will be with us always even to the end of the age. We trust you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Pastor Emily.
we're gonna, I'm going to send you off real quick, but I just want to say a quick prayer over them if we can. Father, I thank you for Jay and Ashley. I thank you for the work that you've called them to do. I thank you for the kids and their family. Lord, I thank you that as we focus on the God of abundance, Lord, that you would reveal yourself in such tangible ways to them this month, that you would be abundant in your provision and your protection and your voice in their lives. Lord, we thank you for what they do, and we ask that you would place your hand all over it. Lord, blessings on blessings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We love you. Don't forget Ignite Night, Wednesday night.